the original speakers of the Indo-European languages. In the 18th century, a British judge from India discovered surprising similarities between English, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, the language of India. Later, these similarities were also found in most of the other languages of Europe, in the languages of the Iranian plateau, which includes Persian, and also in some dead languages from modern-day Turkey and even from the edge of China. Because of these similarities, these languages were grouped together and are now known as the Indo-European languages. Take, for instance, the word mother in all these languages. It is mater in Latin, mater in Sanskrit, mother in Persian, mother in English, and mother in my own language, Dutch. In this lecture, we'll discuss the detective work done by linguists, the students of language, to find the root of all these languages. This root is now known as Proto-Indo-European, shortened as Pi, and it was spoken by a people who no longer exist and who had no script, so they left us no writing. But despite this, linguists have managed to reconstruct with reasonable certainty about 1500 words of their language. They have done this by studying the rules by which languages change over time. By applying these rules to the remaining Indo-European languages, they were able to backtrack a large part of the Pi vocabulary. And as words tell us much about people's lives, it even allowed them to discover the location at which these people lived, which happens to be the steppes of Ukraine and Russia since at least 4000 BC. Near this location, we've also found the first evidence of horse-drawn chariots with spoked wheels, which became their ultimate tool to spread out over the Eurasian continent, allowing for that impressive spread of languages. Now, join me today to understand how this was all discovered. Let's go. Hey, good to see you. This is Stefan, author of In Search of the Sublime. On this World History Channel, we'll trace humanity's relentless pursuit of scientific truth, moral excellence, and enlightenment. We'll meet anyone from Mesopotamian astronomers and Indian yogis to Greek philosophers and enlightenment scientists. And you'll meet them firsthand using primary sources giving you valuable insights that transcend the surface level understanding you get on other channels. Go check it out for yourself. Let's start. In the 18th century, a British judge in India named William Jones noticed similarities between English, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. He concluded that these languages have, quote, a stronger affinity both in the roots of verbs and in the forms of grammar than could possibly have been produced by accident. So strong indeed that no philologer, no student of language, could examine them all without believing them to have sprung from a common source, which perhaps no longer exists. And this source is now called Proto-Indo-European, or Pi. Over the years, these similarities were found in many more languages located in the area ranging from Europe to the edge of China. These languages include most of the European languages, except for Basque, Finnish, Estonian and Hungarian. It includes the Persian languages of Iran, and also Sanskrit from India and its daughter languages Hindi and Urdu. And also a number of extinct languages, including Hittite from the area now Turkey, and Tocharian from the deserts of northwestern China. Let's now discuss some of these similarities in these languages. For example, the Sanskrit word Agni, meaning fire, and Agni is also the name of their fire god, is still related to the English word ignite, which of course also has to do with fire. And another example, the Sanskrit word Atman, meaning to breathe, and it later also came to mean the soul in India, is related to the German word Atman, and in Dutch, my own language, it is Ademen. And these words also mean to breathe. And like this, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples. The original speakers of Proto-Indo-European left us no writing, yet we have discovered much about them. How, you might ask? Well, that is what we are going to figure out right now. First of all, there are regularities in the ways spoken words change over time. 
For instance, all words in Latin starting with que transformed in medieval French into ce and then in modern French into se. And if you make these sounds yourself, you find that they become progressively easier to pronounce, which all sound changes have in common. Take for instance the Latin word cantum, meaning hundred. It became centum in medieval French and later sans. And these changes were specific to the que sound and did not occur, for instance, to words starting with co. For instance, the Latin costa became cote in French. And here we've come to an important principle of linguistics. Linguists generally only accept a reconstructed word if it can be traced back through these well-established sound changes. With this toolkit, the word hundred, for instance, can be traced back to the pi root kumtum. In Proto-Germanic, for instance, it became kumtum and later humdom and then hunda, which finally evolved into hundred in English. And on the other side, the pi root kumtum also became katam in Proto-Indo-Iranian, then satam in Avestan, an old Iranian language, and sata in Sanskrit from India. Comparing all these languages, the pi root kumtum turned out to be the only word that can develop in all these daughter words through these well-established sound changes. The validity of these linguistic techniques has since been tested empirically a number of times. In three cases so far, a reconstructed word was later discovered to actually exist. For instance, the pi root ghosty, meaning guest, was predicted to become gustis in Proto-Germanic, and this word was later actually discovered in Denmark. And similarly, the Proto-Greek sound kö was first completely theoretical, but was later discovered on early Greek linear B tablets. Linguists have also looked at the rate at which languages change over time. With this rate, we can roughly calculate how long ago two languages diverged from a common ancestor. Let's apply this, for example. The oldest language to detach from Pi was Proto-Anatolian, spoken in what is now Turkey. We know this must be the oldest branch, since it contains a lot of archaic elements that we do not see in any other of the Indo-European languages. By studying the difference between Proto-Anatolian and the other Indo-European languages, and using that rate of change, it has been determined that the Proto-Anatolian split from Pi must have occurred around 4000 BC, very roughly. And this means that Pi is at least as old as this, and likely much older. Interestingly, Hittite, one of those Anatolian languages, is also the only Indo-European language that does not contain a word for wheel that can be traced back to Pi. And this also goes for other words related to wagons. And since the wheel was likely invented around 3500 BC, this matches well with the split of Proto-Anatolian around 4000, meaning they split off before the invention of the wheel, and that is why the pi word for wheel did not end up in their language. But where did the Proto-Indo-Europeans live? Again, we turn to linguistics. The trick is by looking at the pi vocabulary. Because from the words people use, we can discover a lot about their lives. A great start is by looking at words for animals and plants. The Pi vocabulary does not include the names of Mediterranean and tropical species, for example, which then immediately rules out these areas. They do have the word horse, which at the time only lived in the steppes of Eurasia. And we also have words for honey and bee which rules out Siberia and the Central Asian steppes. The presence of words for domesticated animals, including cow, ox, sheep and pig, rules out areas solely occupied by hunter-gatherers. And since there is no word for city in Pi, or other words to do with city, we also expect them to be nomads. Finally, we can search for words which the Proto-Europeans borrowed from their neighbors. These words come mainly from Proto-Uralic, from the southern flanks of the Ural Mountains in mid-Russia. All these clues together point to the steppes just north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, in what is now Ukraine and Russia. 
Archaeological research in this area further strengthened this conclusion. Evidence suggests that people migrated out of this area in separate groups in a number of waves. And these waves roughly correspond both in time and direction with the spread of the Indo-European languages over the Eurasian continent. The next question is, how did these people manage to spread out over such a large territory? The key here is the horse. Evidence seems to suggest that the first horse riders appeared in this area around 3500 BC, since at this time the teeth of horses begin to show bit wear, which of course is a sign of domestication. Because of their speed, horses allowed nomads to control larger herds and also to spread out over a much larger territory. The wheel also appeared around this time, both in Europe and the Middle East. We're not quite sure where the wheel was first discovered, but we know it spread really quickly. Especially impressive here are the wagon graves in the Pai homeland. About 250 of these graves have been found, dated between 3000 and 2000 BC. Here we see a very early example from around 3000 BC. We clearly see here a buried figure next to a beautifully preserved wagon. And notice that the wheels at this time are solid blocks of wood. The earliest evidence for horse-drawn chariots with spoked wheels comes from about 2000 BC, from the so-called Sintashta culture, which is located just northeast of that Pai homeland. These spoked wheels of course made wheels much lighter, and therefore chariots are much faster than wagons, and they became the ultimate tool to spread out over Eurasia. And here we see one of those chariot graves. At the top we see what might be a charioteer with a few weapons next to two horses. And at the bottom we see the imprints of two wheels with spokes. And at the bottom right, by the way, we can see the side view of these wheels. The wood by then had long deteriorated, but they stained the soil, allowing the shape of these wheels to remain visible. The invention of the chariot was soon picked up by other cultures. In the 17th century BC, for instance, it was used by the Hyksos, who conquered Egypt for a while. And it was soon adopted by the Egyptians themselves. And around 1500 BC, it was used all the way in Shang, China. And thus unfolded the great detective work into the origin of the Proto-Indo-European languages. In the next lecture, we'll use linguistics to peer into the minds of these Proto-Indo-Europeans. It turns out we know quite a bit about the mythology of a culture that does no longer exist and left us no writing just by studying these languages. You can learn more about this in the next lecture. And for now, I hope you were inspired and learned a lot. If you want to know more about Proto-Indo-European or many other topics from world history, read my book In Search of the Sublime. See you next time. Bye-bye.